Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy New Year. Why change the format? This, oh, these tractors, they chew up the side so much. I'll just keep the windows down for a second. As we emerge onto the Preston Super Highway. We mirror in. Windows up. There we go. So, the uh, more astute of you were, may have noticed I seem to have got a bit of a head cold. Which is true. I've been coughing and mainly coughing. Blocked up sinuses, etc, etc. So, I've got my lights on, everyone else has got the lights on. It's a funny thing because uh, January tends to be the coldest month. You have to think it's cloud cover, also, although the days are getting longer, they appear to be darker because there's less uh, sunlight coming in. Sertas, no lights on. Sertas. Ooh! Sertas refused to deliver any aviation fuel to me. Ah. Uh, so, first day at work, it's uh, Tuesday, but Monday was a bank holiday. Because the 1st of uh, January was uh, on a Saturday. So we had a day off on the Monday in lieu of the bank holiday we missed. And so now it's Tuesday the 4th, I think. And that uh, reminds me of the year I qualified, because that was exactly what happened. I qualified on uh, the 31st of December or something. Couldn't work on the 1st of January because it was a Saturday and ended up starting on the uh, Monday or the Tuesday of that week. So I qualified in uh, 81, 82, I can't remember. I think I might have qualified 31st of December 1981 and started working on in January 1982. So. Um, bearing in mind it's now January 2022, I think this is, this is probably the 40th anniversary of me working in general practice. And obviously the 45th year, you know, that I've been in dentistry, if you include the five years of dental school. So, you know me. 40 years. Should bring some donuts, shouldn't I? So you shouldn't really bring some donuts. You have to walk the walk. Mind you, I've not really walked yet over Christmas. I have had the odd toffee. Talking of which, I'm already getting phone calls from patients saying their crowns and fillings have fallen out on the odd toffee. So we might be doing quite a bit of emergency work today. It's going to be generally a busy day today. It's going to be uh, emergency treatment only and uh, all the treatment. Now the trouble is I'm off to I'm off on holiday on the 11th to the 25th so I've got from now the 4th to mainly the end of this week and then possibly next Monday to do any emergency work that needs doing and then um, and then any treatment is going to have to be rescheduled for the end of February, uh, sorry, end, end of January February. So that's a problem isn't it? I mean, you know, for the patients so, well, they don't know I'm going on holiday I will tell them because I tell them that, you know, that we're not open these hours. Now, I've just had two weeks in Mauritius because of uh, Mrs. Uh, Angry's 60th uh, birthday. And then I've just had two weeks off for Christmas and New Year. And then I'm about to take two weeks off for to go on holiday to meet a friend of mine who lives in Gambia. Who uh, uh, likes it out there because um, he lives in a caravan on caravan site and uh, they shut it during the winter for legal reasons and um, they have to find somewhere else to stay for three months. So he chose Gambia because it's dead cheap. Which it is, but I'm not staying I'm not I did stay once I stayed there in a room which was dead cheap. But I didn't like it really. It was too uh, I didn't have enough, uh, oh, I suppose I did have autonomy, I mean, you know. The trouble is that the, um, the people who are sort of doing Airbnb in Gambia, they rent 
like the lot who rented it to me, they rented the room out and then they wanted to get electricity on top and then they wanted money for it's when you arrived, you know, and then they wanted money for cleaning when you arrived and and then if you're going out for a meal then uh, you know, you were sort of expected that you'd ask the bloke who lived there to take you in his car, for which he would charge you like a taxi. And then, uh, you know, because we're so polite in English, we we then say, you know, would you like to, you know, can I take you out for dinner, etc., once or twice? And then they um, they they're very happy to come out for dinner with you. And then you know, what happens is if you invite anyone else out. Uh, for dinner then they just turn up at your table because they know where you are and you know and you're like oh hello fancy bumping into you can I get you a drink and you know and they've done this for centuries I don't know so uh, you very uh, you know you very quickly uh, wish that you uh, you're a bit more autonomous but this time I've invented I've I've, uh, I've rented a whole villa to myself, which is nice, I've never done it before, I don't know how it'll work. But I should imagine it's by the time I've finished there, I'll have, I'll have 15 people living with me. Because they all move in and say that they're, they're the housemaid or the cook or the housemaid's sister who does the washing and blah blah blah. And the cook will want the gardener to stay there. and. My friend John summed it up quite well when he said, uh, he said, what you'll do, you'll be walking down the street and I'll say to you, hello John, come in, nice to see you, would you want to fancy a cup of tea? Come and have a cup of tea. And he'll go, yeah, all right then. So then they'll say, uh, um, oh, what is a nuisance, I've run out of milk. I think you couldn't impart the shop and get me some milk. And so John will be all right then. Yeah, OK, I don't mind, I suppose. And then they'll say, I'm right out there, can you get me a box of tea bags? <laughs> you know, they're not, uh, they're not uh, embarrassed or backwards about this, you know. They're just... Uh, they're just like, you know, they take, they take this attitude that you're a friend of mine, and if I'm a friend in need, uh, then uh, friends help out friends, you know. And that, uh, I suppose to a certain extent they do there, because they have gotten that all. I mean, I uh, wanted to change the SIM card in my phone, and uh, we, we searched high and low for anything that was small enough to poke in a SIM card hole to change the SIM card. And eventually we found this woman on the seafront who did uh, bespoke uh, uh, millinery, you know, like uh, changing the lengths of sleeves and stuff like that, like a tailor. And uh, it turned out she had some pins. But it took us uh, it took us 20 minutes to convince her to lend us a pin, lend us a pin. John came back with this pin. She said she wants it back though. So I said, Are you going to take it back? She said, No, I'm not going to take it back. Which is a shame. I'd have taken it back. I mean, but you know, but when, when you get to the. Oh, forget it. Right, so got to turn my, cat, my phone on. This is the problem when you've got a head cold. So now you've got like 10 minutes of really poor audio. Let me just put the window mirrors out.
This is the problem with driving when you've got a cold. It's lethal. I've crashed my car. Several times. Just because I'm bunged up with a cold. Once I decided to try and see how close I could cut to the parked cars. Hello. Someone's getting transferred by ambulance. Yeah, so and I did. I tried to judge the distance by looking in the wing mirror. And you know where it says uh, objects may appear closer than you, th than you think. Well, I, mine doesn't say that, so I forgot that and uh, sideswiped a van. Ripped the whole side of my car. Anyway. So from the dental point of view, what's, what's 2022 going to hold from the dental point of view? Well, uh, the British Dental Association is making a fuss because the, uh, their workload, dentists are being asked to do 85% of their pre-COVID workload for 100% of their pre-COVID income. And they're sort of saying that uh, the, the, the uh, ratchet is being cranked up to uh, or the crank as the ratchet is have been wherever the ratchet is and it's been too fast and uh, or too much <coughs> oh, there's a ratchet for you and uh, <laughs> you know they were on zero weren't they I think and then they went up to 45 and then 65 and then now they're on 85 and in a few months they'll be expected to deliver all their UDAs that were contracted. Although it's possible that the uh, Department of Health will settle at 85% of the workload for 100% of the money on the basis that they are being asked to do more non-clinical <coughs> workload. Something always goes wrong with these videos. to take down his Christmas tree, doesn't he? If you watch these videos and nobody does, then you'll realise that uh, I've just dumped about 15 on YouTube over the Christmas holidays. I was quite pleased about that. So I've managed to, and now I've finally got, now I've got Starlink. I've got an internet service that will upload them in a reasonable sort of time frame. Bearing in mind they're about, well they can be up to six gigabytes, but I've managed to get them down to perhaps less than two. Uh, and you can un upload three of those overnight. Starlink is a Elon Musk project. And, um, involves having like a flat dish somewhere where it's got a clear view of the sky and um, you get sort of very very fast download speeds in the UK at the moment I've had 185 uh, megabits down which considering I used to get like 12 megabits down is you know it's like a considerable improvement and the upload is about uh, uh, well, you, you run into other problems, you know, like, um, but the upload, my upload speeds are now faster than my download speeds used to be. So, but it, it has got a major problem and they don't really advertise this. And that is that they, every one of these dishes needs an internet address. And it's actually an internal internet address for Starlink. So, if you can imagine that you get when you get your internet comes into your router, and then your router gives out an internal address, doesn't it, to everything on your network, all your PCs, your Skybox, and your phone, all the phones and smart plugs and stuff like that. 
So technically nobody can, unless you've configured your router to accept external connections and forward them to the piece of equipment internally, directly, your internal stuff can't really be um, contacted from outside your network. Inside, yeah, but outside not. And Starlink is like that. They've got one internet address which people send the, send the uh, which the data comes from and any data that goes to Starlink but they won't route the the information internally which means that while people might try and send you, you might have an internet address on your uh, Starlink equipment and you might say to someone like you can reach me at this number but then what the, when they do when they try and reach you at that number they'll find that it's not the right number because that number is an internal number to the Starlink network. So while they can contact the Starlink network, Starlink won't route anything directly to your dish. So it's very much one-way traffic. You can't um, you can't get incoming traffic. Now, I mean, if you're all you're doing is uh, that doesn't mean you can't receive anything. You can receive stuff, but you can only receive stuff that's where the transfer has been initiated from from within the network so for example you can uh, send and receive email and stuff like that oh come on who dares wins there we go so I mean so what does this mean in practice well <coughs> if you're used to dialing into your network into the router or something to fix any problems or if your router is um, <coughs> if your router is sharing any resources like a USB drive or a let's say that you your work want an off-site backup from work so what you do is you, you back up from work to home then your backup to home won't work anymore because your backup device at work can't get in touch with your home device you can back up from home to work assuming that your work internet connection works correctly and will accept incoming connections and you've got a fixed IP, but you can't get a fixed IP address on Starlink. And I think that's because they're just very short of IP addresses. They can't afford to hand out <coughs> so many to everyone in the world. They don't have an option to pay to get a fixed IP address. Uh, but I think, and then eventually they're going to go over to this uh, IP version 6 routing uh, addressing space which is to all intents and purposes got an infinite number of addresses in which case I assume that you will then be given an IP6 address which is unique to your dish and you will be able to dial into it but at the moment they're, they're stuck to IP version 4 which is the old version that's running out of address space anyway it's all a bit technical but um, I'm going to keep it, although it is expensive, it's about £100 a month and you pay about £400 for the equipment although the equipment itself is worth far more than that um, but, uh, that's the way that they've got around it, is by not giving everybody an IP address. But that's what IP6 was um, invented to sort out, do you know what I mean? It's like... IP6 is there for everyone to use, and yet no one's using it because it's, you know, I mean, you might have, when you bought your router, three or four years ago you might have actually just turned off IP6 addressing and not remember you know so if they start using IP6 then a lot of things are not going to work 
um, and they don't want the hassle of troubleshooting all that so the internet providers are just sticking with IP4 and, and using more and more ingenious ways to get around the address space limitations but in turn they're hobbling the functionality you know anyway sorry uh, sorry about all the technical problems I've had all sorts of technical problems I, I uh, might not even upload this I probably will but if only for the starling it might be useful to somebody but I'm not I'm not myself my brain is not fine on all cylinders I'm hoping I've just got to do a load of easy temporary fillings today what I suggest you do is you watch these things on double speed anyway if you don't on YouTube there's this little gear icon click on that and it clicks and it says playback speed and you can playback stuff at one and a half which I think is 1.4 if it's interesting and you've got a person who's giving away a lot of information and both people are talking fairly fast and there's no background noise then I would say you can listen at about 1.4 if um, it's like this you know you're listening to someone who's rambling on who's got a head cold then 1.5 easy <laughs> and then your 20 minute video is, uh, tends to be 16 minutes long so you save over 3 minutes of your life or waste over 16 depending on whichever way you want to look at it oh that's Alison she's opening up here we go another year another dollar Right, talk to you soon. Bye. Good evening, good evening. How are you? No, you haven't gone blind. You can't see me. <coughs> I've got the shocking cough. I've been lateral flow to death. So I know it's not that. It's just my usual seasonal runny nose and cough but <clears throat> as soon as I if I'm medicated up to the eyeballs with um, day nurse I'm okay talking of which I haven't got any day nurse I think I've run out no I've got some anyway I thought I'd just record this quick short. Let me just put the light on. Let me just show you I am actually here. I am actually here. There I am. Where's that from? That's from uh, Brazil by Terry Gilliam. Here I am. So, uh, yeah, I thought I'd record a quick, what's it, to commemorate the fact that uh, 40 years ago to the day was my first day in general practice I qualified on the 31st of December and the first and the second I think were this is 81 first and the second were uh, Saturday was the bank holiday Sunday was uh, couldn't work obviously the surgery was shut Monday was a bank holiday in lieu of the first being on the Saturday same as this year and so the first day I started, I think, was on the 4th. The 4th of January, 1982. And today is the 4th of January, 2022. Unbelievable. And of course, came straight out of dental school and was totally convinced that I knew everything. Oh, you should have gone. Then after a year I realised I didn't know anything. But in the second year I was convinced I'd learned everything. And I therefore knew everything. And then in the third year I was convinced that I hadn't known anything for the first two years. 
but I had by the, th the third year I knew everything and so it goes on but I think I know everything now apart from everything I realise I didn't know last year next year that does make sense so unusual to do a video in the dark so doesn't matter I still look the same whoa where are you going there's no advantage to being in that lane mighty no advantage you just go in this lane and then you go round the roundabout and then the lanes all go a bit wafty because they're on the wrong lane now you see they should be in the middle lane and then this lane then goes left and then basically it stops in 400 yards so it's a case of who can accelerate the fastest but thanks to the fact that my little Peugeot goes like a rocket it's a little postman pat van but it's quick because it's always empty anyway I went to work 15 High Street Raynham for a nice dentist called Mr Hunter his name was Julian M Hunter and he insisted on using the M so because he always wrote his name as Julian M Hunter people used to call him Mr Munter because they mistook his middle initial for the first letter of his surname so he got loads of stuff addressed to Mr. Munter. So I've got a soft spot for Julian, he's a nice bloke. Spent a lifetime working for the LDC. <coughs> I was on the LDC, the LDC, Kent LDC once. I went along, because Julian was on it, and he said to me, you've got to come along to the LDC, you know. So I went along and Whoa. And uh, it was a bit, you know, it was a bit boring. They used to hold it in Maidstone in those days. And we were working in Whitstable. And Whitstable to Maidstone, especially when you've had a full day of patience, is a bit of a slog. And then you've got to slog all your way back, you know. And what dentists do, whenever dentists get together at a meeting, all they do is whinge about how things aren't like they used to be and how their surgery's not thriving as much as it could do, etc, etc. So, so I used to go along and listen to this and then one day this bloke came up to me, he might even have been the first day. He came up to me and said, oh, you're, he said, you're new on the LDC, aren't you, dentist? And I said, yeah, I am, yeah. He said, uh, I've been on the LDC, he said, for 35 years, or 25 years or something. I said, oh, that's interesting. And he said, let me tell you, I'll tell you now, it's 35 years of my life wasted. They never do anything. They never achieve anything. All they, it's just a social thing, you know? People just come along, have a chat, go through the motions, elect a chairman, elect a treasurer, elect a secretary. Said letters in those days. I said, my advice to you would be to resign as soon as you possibly can. So I went home after the first meeting and I wrote a letter and resigned. And I tell you what, I don't. If I'd been on the LDC for forty years, I would be giving the same advice to anybody who's who's starting on the LDC now. They don't. They're, they're um, the LDC is a front for the BDA. The BDA um, 
whenever it's challenged in terms of whether it's democratic or not. In other words, whether it represents members who, who don't pay the membership and don't pay and don't get access to the website and all the privileged information they get from the Department of Health. When they're challenged, they say, no, um, we incorporate the LDCs. And the LDCs, by their very nature, must be democratically set up. So they sort of, um, they get that veneer of uh, democracy by working with and through the LDCs. And it's very valuable to them, because otherwise they'd just be another special register body, another trade union. And they, wouldn't, they, they couldn't then claim that um, they represented everybody. But they represent everybody by virtue of their connection and work through the LDCs. So that's why the LDCs are perpetuated. That's why the, uh, the BDA and the LDCs work so closely together. But I must say, you know, it became more... Um, it would have become more difficult for me to have been on the LDC. Because the LDC were, you know, very much geared towards... NHS dentistry and I was really by 1984 was going into the private sector um, and uh, increasingly you know so it was it was more you know questions were asked about what uh, private dentists were doing on LDCs um, although I never really got that myself the BDA tried to incorporate the General Dental Practitioners Association funnily enough they um the, the GDPA was a sort of the military wing of the BDA in the 1950s and 60s. And we caused them, we caused them quite a lot of grief early on. And then uh, what they did was they said, look, you know, we've got this General Dental Services Committee, which committee set up to oversee general practice, which is your area of concern, why don't you send a couple of representatives along? And um, so we did, myself and James Spence, a Scottish dentist who practices on the, or practiced on the Isle of Wight, <coughs> went along to the um, GDSC, General Dental Services Committee of the BDA, for a few years. But it was very much, uh, you know, I mean, it, it was a poison chalice insofar as whenever we protested about everything, we were always, you know, there was two of us, and 200 of them. And uh, also, if we ever uh, kicked up a fuss about anything to the press or the Department of Health or something, Department of Health said, look, you know, I don't know what you're, you are represented on the GDSC, you know, which is the sort of quasi-autonomous subcommittee set up by the BDA to consider all things high street so you know what, what are you complaining about you've got to do this through the GDSC and by which they meant through the BDA and of course the you know the BDA was was never going to do anything that we wanted but it effectively sort of shut us up for a couple of years so in the end we didn't you know it just we just stopped going you know but um, hello why would you want to drive why would you want to ride a bike home I bet it's that bloke we went past this morning why would you want to ride a bike home it's about one degrees it's blowing a hoolie there's no bike path there. I mean, there is a tarmac bike path on the right-hand side of the road. But he, no, he wants to drive in the road on a dual carriageway. <coughs> and you see all these islands. They put all these islands in to stop motorists overtaking each other. And so as a result, what they do is they, they concentrate all the traffic down into a narrow gap, a narrow gap by reducing the width of the road literally by 
one lane. So of course if you end up going through one of these narrow gaps where, where, with a cyclist on the left hand side then one of you is in trouble aren't they? It's very rarely the car the cyclist that kills the car driver. Yeah, so I, I mean, I was when I qualified, I was already a member of the GDPA, and uh, we used to meet at the Ariel Hotel, which at that time was uh, was a, is a Heathrow, still is a Heathrow, uh, but it was um, a circular hotel, reminding me very much of Stingray in terms of the design. You know, it was uh, very much a 60s design. Not anymore. I suppose, in the interest of uh, increasing the floor space, they've re they've redesigned it and made it more square, you know, boxy. So as a result, it's just a totally nondescript, although reasonably well located, Heathrow Hotel. But th those are the heydays of the GDPA, the 70s and the 80s, for me anyway. Oh, went a bit pear-shaped a bit later. day nurse I think. Yeah so I worked for Julian sort of for the best part of nearly three years then I bought my first practice 240 Tankerton Road Whitstable CT52AY and uh, stripped it out put a load of dental stuff in I asked the bloke, the bloke who sold it to me, I asked him if he'd mind if we put the dental stuff in before we completed. And giving me his due, he was very, he said he shouldn't really, but he did let us. And so as a result, as soon as I completed on the purchase, I was able to open the next day. And I think that was in November 84. Or it might have been November 83. Anyway, I used to, I worked in uh, Raynham part time, and then I worked in um, I went down to Whitstable and worked part time. Then eventually it sort of built up in Whitstable. So, well, I had made a horrendous mistake because I very assiduously I charted all the local surgeries and in deciding where to set up, and I'd done that from the. Uh, dental uh, estimates board list of dentists in the area and then um, I found out that there was a massive practice just up the road in the local health centre but um, it hadn't shown up on the dental estimates board figures because um, it was a community centre practice. With hindsight, I needn't have worried. But in those days, well, I'd say it was a community dental. It wasn't strictly like, you know, for the treatment of people with special needs. It was a dental surgery located within a building which also housed all the local doctors. So it was actually, you know, they were very well situated there. And they did used to do a lot of NHS um, work. And of course, at the time, I was in, uh, totally NHS. And so they made it more difficult, but we got there in the end. There's a very nice dentist who used to work there called Jane McGuckin. She 
was married to a guy who was uh, worked for the Inland Revenue in um, enforcement. So you can imagine the conversation at dinner parties they used to go to. What with one of them being a dentist and the other one working for the tax office. Well, they were cheerful enough. And then um, one of my nurses left the practice and went to work for her, which pissed me off a bit, until she rang me up and said, you know that nurse who came to work for me, she's had her fingers in the towel. And I realised that, that she couldn't do that to me because we had an um, electronic till that printed out a till receipt. And so we used to reconcile at the end of the day everything that had been taken through the till with everything that had been credited to the patient's accounts. But they didn't do that. They had, um, oh, they had a system where they just wrote on the patient's notes what they paid and then half the time they just trousered the cash which I thought was quite funny, seeing her husband worked in HMRC enforcement. Anyway, that's how, that's how she'd done it. So the nurse had just written down that the patient had paid, and when they paid cash, she'd just written down that the patient had paid on the notes, and um, just not bothered to uh, write it in the book of the takings for the day. And so, um, in future, you know, when they were... Who's going to discover that, you know? I mean, they've got the record card saying all the payments have been made, Who's going to who's going to double check that against the um, the day book? Anyway, that was a long time ago and far, far away. Um, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. I am smiling.